sludge is not a genre in Sweden. We don't know what sludge is. But if you want to call us sludge, please do.
Welcome to the Dreams of Consciousness podcast. If you'd be so kind, would you mind introducing yourself? Yeah, I'm Henrik Levan, the singer and guitarist of the Swedish band Horndal. I guess why we're talking here, Adrian, is because we just released our new record, our third album called Head Hammer Man. And it's a record and it's a book. And so it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a weird project, but uh, I guess we're going <laughs> to talk about it later on here. And Henrik, how would you describe the music of Horndal? You know, the music of Horndal is kind of the blend between four different people. It's my brother who is writing the music, most of it. But we, the bands we have in common is, I guess, Black Sabbath and, yeah, Entombed and Thin Lissy, actually. <laughs> and my brother, he, he comes from the kind of the punk and the hardcore and the, and nowadays the weird frog stuff and things like that. And so it, it, it's kind of a blend between all this kind of, it's kind of hard to describe. When Americans talk about it, they say it's sludge. Sludge is not a genre in Sweden. We don't know what sludge is. But if you want to call a sludge, please do. We call it rusty metal because of the story of our steel mill that don't exist anymore. And we come from this depressing place called Hornell. So similar to what's what's known as the Rust Belt in the US, is, is Horndal a place where there was a lot of industry and then the industries vanished? Yeah, exactly, exactly. You know, we share the same stories from with a with the Rust Belt in America and the black country in 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 Great Britain and Ruhr in Germany. You know, you have these areas all around the world and as it happened in the 70s in 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 America and all over the world when the industrial crisis came, Hornell went from a flourishing small little town with 2,000 or 3,000 people to nowadays it's like 800. Just one shop, no, no nothing. You know, it's, it's kind of a ghost town, honestly. But I love it. <laughs> <laughs> well, why do you love it? You know, because it's, it's my hometown. You know, that's where I grew up and uh, still have friends there, even though we're, we're a lot of le lot less people. But, uh, you know, I, I, had, I had some years when I didn't want to, you know, I didn't live in Horndal for, for a lot of years, but now I bought a house south of Horndal. So I'm slowly coming back to it and I truly love it. Uh, you know, uh, when you get older, you, 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 your childhood means more and more for you, I guess, for me at least. So you mentioned yeah. the Black County in the UK, yeah, and the Ruhr Valley in in, in Germany. In Germany, yeah. Coincidentally, all these places became big hotbeds for metal. Yeah. Do you find that your your surroundings and the place that you you grew up really influenced the kind of music that you like, or influences you now when you make music? You know. You know, when I was 15, Horndal was called heavy Horndal. You know, everybody listened to metal from Horndal. Everybody. And it was said like with a smirk in the face from the guys from the, the, the bigger town called Avesta. And they were like listening to new romantic, like Spandau Ballet and such rubbish. And uh, But we were listening to metal. And, you know, and Horndal is from from Sweden and Judas Priest and Black Sabbath is from the black country. So I guess you're right there. Are scorpions from the Ruhr? Uh, is Hanover in the Ruhr area? I d I'm not sure about that, but maybe we have other German bands that... Uh, yeah, like Creator and Sodom, I think, are all from... Oh, they're, they're, yeah, yeah, Creator and Sodom is from... Yeah, yeah, sure. Absolutely. Okay, <laughs> so Creator and Sodom is from, from, from the Ruhr area. Actually, we have a song on, on the, the record called Lake Drinker, called Ruhr, that when I'm just screaming all these places all around the world that uh, has been abandoned. So listen to that song. 
if you want to know, know some depressing geography lesson. <laughs> <laughs> I do need to bring up uh, one of your band members is Daniel Eckroth. Yeah. Who listeners will, will know from writing a, not just a book about Swedish death metal, but the book about Swedish death metal. The Swedish death metal professor. Yeah. Yeah. He's from a small town called Fosch. Sounds like force in English. Cool. Sounds really cool. But it's like 10 minutes from Horndal. And we went to the same high school. So he studied in Horndal. And we became friends when we were like 14. So he's from the area. So I only have a, a general understanding of the, the geography of Sweden. Like I know where Gothenburg is and Stockholm. Yeah. Rio. Yeah. In relation to Stockholm, where is, where's Horndal? How far is it? It's like t- two hours north. Okay. Uh, north, north, northwest, so to speak. So it's it's in the middle of the country. Okay. And this uh, our black country is called Bärislagen, and there is the, the, there <laughs> and the, that is the abandoned place of Sweden nowadays. And you know, you yourself wrote a book, which we'll discuss in in some detail in a little bit, but. Uh, yeah. Before we get there, yeah. can you tell me a little bit about the origins of the band Horndal? Did it start with you and your brother? It started with me and my brother. You know, he's 12 years younger than me. And I taught him how to play when he was a kid. And he v- got much better than me. So he he went to be a professional musician. And, uh, and then we decided like eight years ago that we should start playing together. And... You know, the story is so connected with Horndal. We decided that we wanted to call ourselves Horndal. And during the, the, the crisis in the 70s, my parents were a part of this theatrical group, you know, very left wing, having this play like, like a protest play about the, 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 when, when the steel mill was shut down. And that play was about the devil that comes to Horndal stealing the money from the steel mill and left all the people to kind of die in this uh, area. And we thought that is a great metal story. So we took the lyrics from that play and and, and translated them and made new music to it. And then we thought, okay, now what? Is there more stories to tell about this small town? But all of a sudden, we saw saw the news that Google was about to build new, what is it called, server server facilities in Hornell, and uh, you know they they cut down a lot of trees and deforest a big area, and decided that they wanted to use our lake as a cooling system for their uh, servers, and that we had this great story. We thought that now the devil is back in town, and the devil is google so then we made this our second album called lake drinker and then all of a sudden we we stumble upon this story that i guess we're going to talk about soon on the third record so that's kind of how the band evolved the last years until now so with the taking inspiration from google setting up their their servers uh as well as uh the the strike that you wrote about on this most recent record. Yeah. You write about a lot of labor issues and a lot of environmental issues, a lot of real world issues. Do you consider Horndal to be a political band or maybe a historical band? We're a metal band, but we think it's more interesting to write about real stuff. You know, the dragons and the swords and all that, that is for, for the other bands. We are about to tell, tell the story about our hometown. And we, when we do that, it tends to be political because, you know, you have this that problem. I don't know. You, you know, America has that problem as well. And with, with all these areas where people are suffering. And we want to describe the situation in Horndal and... It can get political, but that's not the purpose. The purpose is to tell the story about our hometown. When you and Pontus uh, put the band together, Mm -hmm. did you have a clear idea? I mean, you mentioned some bands like Black Sabbath and Entombed. Mm -hmm. Did you have a clear idea of what kind of music you wanted Horndall to make? Yeah, it it was supposed to be like 
heavy music, riff, riff based music, but we were certain that we didn't want it to sound like metal. Is it, we know we wanted it to sound scary in some ways, you know, metal has become like music for, for families, you know, and with, with these compressed sounds, with all the computers and the rigged drums and stuff like that, you know, we are, we, we wanted it to be as acoustic as possible. You know, we're not using any kind of that kind of stuff. It's real amps, real instruments, really old drums recorded properly. I guess we're going to talk about that, uh, about the new record, because that is kind of, that is total madness talking about that. So, scary, hard organic music yeah yeah before we talk about the new record uh i, I just want to touch on uh, your songwriting a little bit mm -hmm. you mentioned that your brother pontus writes most of the music mm -hmm. he does does he does he demo stuff with a computer or anything like that or uh do you guys jam stuff out you know it's mostly his his work actually you have to i have to give him that He's a kind of a genius writing all these songs, but he had this, his musical taste is so wide. And for, for every new record, he's letting more and more of that kind of odd influences into it. So I'm totally focused on the lyrics. And when I listen to the songs, I, he, cause he sends me like these demos and I, I listen to them, and then we, we we kind of meet up in the rehearsing room and 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 work with it. But it's 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 his work, and uh, uh, yeah, I'm so amazed. And sometimes it is so weird stuff that he sends me. You know, it <laughs> some of the songs on this record I couldn't believe. Is this really who and all? Can this sounds can this sound like us? But in the end, it kind of did. I think even if it's, it's a more wider range of music on this one.
So, on the 5th of April, Prosthetic Records released your third album, Head yeah. Hammer Men. Yeah. And a book of the same name, which you wrote, yeah. was also released. <laughs> Tell me about the Head Hammer Man. Who is he? The Head Hammer Man is a guy from Sweden called Aldrich Andersson. And he was a, black, a smith at the steel mill in Hornall. And that is actually his working title that he got later on in his life. And he was 28, no, no, he was 27 years when I chose him as the leader of the trade union, the local trade union in Horndal in 1909, the same year as uh, we had this great general strike in Sweden that he was kind of unprepared happening in. And it became very violent, in, in, especially in Horndal during that time, because they started to evict the workers, the unionized workers from their homes. And there came a lot of people from, from all of Sweden to, to take part in the protests. And the military came and the workers got guns and dynamite. And, it, you know, it, Sweden were on the verge of a civil war there. So the prime minister decided that he had to stop this just to prevent the risk of a civil war. And Ulrich, the union leader, it started to negotiate with uh, with the bosses at the steel mill, and he made them to take them all back. Uh, they got the the jobs back, their homes back, except for one man, and that was Ulrich, because he got blacklisted in the same moment as the other guys got their work back. So to be blacklisted in Sweden at that time, that made it impossible for him to to, to get any job anywhere in Sweden. So he had to exile to America. And he went to Chicago, and there he started working at Columbia Steel at Chicago Heights. And there he became the head hammer man. And here he is. Very cool. And so that's, that's, that's the book that you wrote. Yeah. Now, are you are you a journalist or a novelist? No, by profession. No, I'm a writer. I'm writing stuff. Yeah, I'm a professional writer in in some ways. Yeah, and I I, I, I write different stuff. But I'm you know I'm I'm as I'm a teacher from the get go. So in in Swed Swedish and literature and music. So that's that's what I do. Okay, so from our conversation, I can tell that you're you're very interested in. In the history and the, you know, the uh, the way that the history uh, affects the culture and and the present day in your hometown, and so it seems like a very natural topic uh, to to write about Ulrich. Yeah. But you know, in terms of the undertaking for writing a book, I mean, this is this is a, a from what I understand, a very long book. I, th I believe it's almost four hundred pages. Yeah, it's four hundred pages. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and so you know mm. what. What led you to, to choose to go on this endeavor? Why was this an important story for you to tell? I think at first it was about a guy from Horndal that is kind of crucial for our band. Then, you know, all these immigrant stories about Swedes that uh, came to America, that is, a, for me, a, a, such a vivid story because we have family there. As you can see, can you see my hat here? That's Levon Brothers. Okay. This is a plumbing company from Minnesota. Oh, cool! So it's it's yeah. So it's all our, we traded merch. So they are working in Horndal t-shirts, and I got their hat. So it, <laughs> it's great, you know. <laughs> so this is so uh, you know Swedes are s still thinking about these Im immigrant stories. One point five million Swedes went to America. And in Sweden, there, there, there are novels and stories about it. And most of the stories is about the, the, the guys that went to Minnesota, became farmers. But the story that, you know, most of, of Swedes went to be in workers in Chicago. Chicago was the second biggest town in Sweden 
120 years ago. There were more Swedes in Chicago than in Gothenburg. So all these stories has always been such an interest for me. I'm, I'm reading about it so much. And when I, when I, when I found Ulrich, I, I couldn't help myself, you know. I started, I, I opened an ancestry account and started researching him. Not, not my own relatives, but, but I, I found him and I found his relatives in America. And nowadays, one of my best friends is his granddaughter. And her, she's 76 years old, living in Los Angeles. And uh, her name is Holly. And when we had the book release here, she came with his husband to Sweden. And I got the possibility to take her to Horndal and show her where Ulrich lived and where the evictions took place and where the steel mill was that is now a ruin and stuff like that. You know, it was a very touchy moment for me. And yeah, is that a, you know, I, 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 I'm, <laughs> I can't stop thinking about these immigrant stories. That is kind of a, a sickness that I have. <laughs> so, from initially discovering uh, Ulrich and, and doing the research on his ancestry and where his where his descendants ended up, yeah, to you writing writing the book, how long did this mm -hmm. process take? You know, I started with writing the lyrics for the record. You know, but uh, but I realized that uh, you know, like eight bars in a in a in a uh, I, I it's not it, it's not enough yeah i need more words so i decided quite early on that it has to be a book and uh, it took me three years with all the research i've been to archives all over sweden on uh, ancestry and doing interviews and stuff like that and then the writing process and stuff like that and then my editor erased like one third of the book <laughs> <laughs> and <laughs> So good to know that it, that it was actually a lot longer. <laughs> <laughs> so it was almost a 600 page book. Yeah, it was, you know, it's, 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 it's me, you know, I, I, you know, I said, I told you it's a sickness that I have, you know, it was more like a game of Thrones big kind of, <laughs> but no, I, I have to, I have to, you know, she was right and I was wrong and yeah, but now it, it's quite easy to read and I wrote it like a, not like a thriller, but it's it's meant to be like what do you call it? a page turner. You want to you really. Right. I want the people to be curious what happens on the next page. So that's quite. It, it seems that I pe people tell 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 me that that it's um, they they are accusing me for messing their nightly sleep because they've been reading all night and stuff like that. And it's very very nice to hear. <laughs> Yeah. Hmm. Now, as you mentioned, uh, you you were already thinking of this as being the concept for for uh, a Horndal album. Yeah. When did when did you and Pontus sit down and start discussing the music and how the music would flow for for the story? He already started to. He has already started to write the music, and uh, you know, I was like. I was so amazed when, when he sent me all this music because th then I had the the story in my head because you know it was it it wasn't a hard sell for him you know I said you know I found this guy he he went to America he became a head hammer man have you heard c can anything be more metal than a head hammer man so uh, <laughs> you know uh, <laughs> and then he, okay let go do that and then he and then I, when I listened to the songs I. I felt okay. This is this song must be about the evictions, the violent evictions with the military and and you know stuff like that. And the song that is called "Call Labor." I just saw the imagery of they when they came to Ellis Island and what 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 happened there, you know. And have you seen the cover? Here's Al, and this is actually this this is a. a what is it called uh, when you play when you're playing with a you, you know it's a what do you call it a board play when you when you play like this with um you turn the dice with dices and stuff like that like roulette like a roulette wheel 
No, more like the, you turn you turn the dice and you, then you move some stuff. You know, I got I got a three, like one, two, three. Okay. So so the inspiration comes from 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 that because they made that kind of a game in uh, during the strike, and I found this picture, and it looked like this. And uh, then we, we we our illustrator helped us. So so every every piece here is one song. So uh, here is here is famine. It's the Grim Reaper. You know, we had famine during the strike, so and, uh, and stuff like that. You know, so that is a record. <laughs> One weird thing. Can I tell you another weird thing? Sure. I know. I know this savant lady. You know, I found a lot of handwritten letters from Ulrich to his wife and to you know to to Stockholm uh, during the strike, and she copied his handwriting. So this is her writing Ulrich's handwriting, all the all the lyrics here. It's kind of amazing, you know, she's a really savant lady. Big up to Agnes Prince. Yeah. Very cool. So the book is a historical novel. Is it uh is it told in a uh straightforward be uh beginning to end way? Uh, no, you know, it's quite chronologic, chronological, but the editor that made me take away one third of the book, she told me that we need to know about you. So write some chapters about, so, so then I wrote kind of, I wrote my life in short pieces through the book. So it, so, so it's, a, it, 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 so from 1909, it's suddenly it's 1973, and I'm three years old. You know stuff like that, but it's very short. No, yeah. So, but okay. beside from that, it's quite from the from the start to end. What happened to him? Okay. Well, what about the the lyrics for the the, the album? Mm -hmm. is, is that a narrative that you can follow from beginning to end, or is it more about the themes of of his life? You know, uh, on on the record, we made the you know we arranged the songs on a more of a musical manner, you know? It's not the chronological, it's not a musical, but it can be if you, if you, if you choose them in a different way. Uh, we did a Swedish podcast, uh, uh, sadly in Swedish, when we told the story and played the songs in the correct order, so to speak, and made it like a musical. <laughs> yeah. You, you mentioned that you don't like the way that a lot of uh, modern metal is is being recorded is very uh, produced uh, and overly reliant on technology. When you guys recorded this, did you record live? Were you in the studio together? Most of it, but the drum parts were kind of crucial because Pontus had this vivid idea and uh, the, about a record that we listened to when we were kids, and it's the first kind of rock album that was made in Sweden in 1970 by a guy called Pug Rågefelt. You should check him out. And on that record, there is a Swedish drummer called Loffe Karlsson, who was a part of a band called Hansson and Karlsson that actually jammed and played with Jimi Hendrix. And uh, there are some recordings with these three guys, organ and drums. And Pontus fell in love with that kind of drum sound. So we decided to go to the exact studio. It's actually, actually the studio that ABBA was recording the record in. <laughs> and we put the drums. We have, we've seen all these pictures of the recording of this Pug Rogefeldt album. So we put the drums at the exact spot. And we used the same mics because they're still there, really old mics, and put them at the exact positions where Loffe Carlson had them in 1970. And you can actually hear it at best in a song called Famine, where it starts with uh, this drum beat. This drum beat was uh, by Loffe Carlson on that record. The song is called Love, Love, Love. You should check it out. This is really aggressive drumming, and the sound is really annoying, actually. <laughs> and there is a there is a American DJ called DJ Shadow. Have you ever heard of him? I, I, it's not metal. It's like you know, it's it's electronic music. But he sampled this Swedish record on one of his uh, hit songs. So uh, 
Uh, so it's been heard outside of Sweden as well. The studio where you recorded was Atlantis Studios? Yeah, Atlantis. Yeah, exactly. Who is the team who, who worked on the recording, the engineering and the, the mixing? Yeah, it, you know, it, it's co-produced with a guy called Anton Sundell. He is, uh, you know, he's a really clever guy, but he mostly works with like jazz and stuff like that. And with a band called Tonbruket, which you probably not have heard of, but it's the keyboard player from the band Soundtrack of Our Lives, if you maybe remember them. It was like, like a psychedelic rock band in the 90s. And actually, the keyboard player appears on our record now. So it is Anton and, and us, and Anton mixed it as well. And then we... I actually don't remember the name of the guys who mastered it, but, but so it was Anton and, and us, and mostly Pontus with the mixing. So you, you mentioned that the studio was, was responsible for a lot of classic records. There, there is a strong psychedelic and almost prog rock uh, feeling to, to this album. Were you guys trying to get a, like a classic, almost 70s kind of sound to this? Yeah, you know, it, it came naturally when we when we try we, we decided to use this this really wide drum sound, and we decided to not doing a reamping at all. You know, we decided to use like big muff <laughs> fuzz pedals and playing the guitars through bass amps, and that combined with this really strange and airy kind of guitar sounds that and some of it sounds like the shadows i think you know this really funky funky guitar playing so uh, i i don't yeah but, but it's it, it's it's a lot of uh, 70s influences of course it is
you mentioned that Anton contributed to this album as well as engineering the album. Uh, you also had a few other guests uh, contribute to this album as well, right? Yeah, we had. For example, Martin Hedros, who is the was the keyboard player of quite known Swedish band called Soundtrack or Lives. They were they hit it off in the nineties. Were kind of popular in in the UK. I don't know about uh, America actually, but uh, they were really great. And him and I went to music college together. So we he 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 went away with Soundtrack of Our Lives, and then we kind of uh, met again. And he's playing really great organ stuff. And then we have these these horns that are played by a fantastic guy called David Brynteson. But not to forget Hank. Henke Henrik Palm, maybe you know about him. He's an artist himself, fantastic songwriter and guitarist. So he plays two of the solos on the on the record, and yeah, that was really great. So I guess that is the guest musicians on the record. If I haven't forgotten anyone, but I think so. Yeah. Oh, my 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 best friend. Pelle Jakobsson from the Royal Symphonic Orchestra is the percussionist. So if you hear the the anvil, the the head, the hammer that hits the anvil in the at the beginning of the record, that's him. That's great. Yeah. Did he have to use a a special type of hammer? Like, what's what's the process of recording a hammer? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, you, you know, it's uh, it's quite. It's a, have you seen any, anybody playing the anvil? Because this is an actual instrument in in, in classical music. But it is what it is. It's the same piece that you use in a in a forge. You know, it's a it's a metal hammer and an anvil that you hit. That is that. You know, that's awesome. Yeah, you mentioned Henrik from In Solitude and Ghost, and Martin from the soundtrack of our lives. Did you know them? Did you know them well uh, before you asked them to to guess on the album? Yeah, M- Martin is a friend of mine. So so that that was easy to to talk to him and the Pontus is a friend of, of Henrik Palm so that was kind of easy and we we have gig together in Sweden as well we're going to do that in a couple of weeks we're going to play Oslo and Gothenburg this, together so it's going to be it's going to be great very cool so at the time we're having this conversation the album has been out for a little bit and the book has been out as well i'm curious what the reaction was uh, in Sweden to this uh, this this piece of history that you you wrote about and uh, the album that that is inspired by it. Yeah, you know we are totally blown away about the reactions here. You know we we, we the, the reviews are are so good. Not even just from the Swedish uh, area and from from the UK. And we when we, you know you get to kind of you know it's um, it's um, you know it. it I can't. I can't take it in how how positive people are about it. I guess maybe the music stuff. I guess people are, like I said, tired of this overproduced metal music with where the where the danger has disappeared. You know, it's it's just it's like it's like bodybuilding music. You know, it's <laughs> it's it's not scary anymore. So I guess. People, people, people are kind of wanted that. It, 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 I, I feel that though, and you know, it's very humbling about the about the book. You know, this story about this man, because it, this kind of happened at the same time where we have this strike in. We have this conflict. We, but you know, the the, the trade union, the metal trade union, had this conflict in Sweden with Tesla, where. The trade union. We have this model in Sweden that whether where the bosses and the union are kind of negotiating once a year, and they they have this deal that was made in 1935, and both parts have been honoring this situation since that. And that and because of that, we don't have any strikes in Sweden. But then Elon Musk came to Sweden with with Tesla and refused to 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 follow this old deal that we are doing here. So then the, we had this strike. 
And it kind of, you know, it 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 felt like this kind of the same story that happened in not not in violence and military, but you know, Ulrich Anderson, if he lived these days, he probably has been involved in that strike with Tesla, I guess. And so kind of feel that the history repeats itself. Yeah. Yeah. And and honestly that's that's one of the reasons why it was important for me to to cover this album and to, to speak with you guys about it, because you know, at the time that we're having this conversation, uh, you know, this, this this very week, just a few days ago, there was a, a an important victory for the United Auto Workers Union um, in the U.S. And yeah. in recent years, there there have been you know all these struggles against big companies like Amazon, Starbucks, you know, mm. uh, union workers trying to organize. Mm. And so Ulrich, you know, Ulrich has been dead for. Since 1970, since, uh, yeah, he, since 1970, yeah. But the the struggle, you know, that he was a part of, hmm. I think, is never ending. I think we're always going to find, especially with you know this new gig economy, tech economy, exactly. app economy that's coming up. Yeah, you know, there's there's always going to be this, yeah, you know, this battle between the working man yeah. and, and these kind of you know, yeah. uh, pernicious forces that try to yeah. take advantage of us. And, uh, and I, I think that like young people that, you know, are, are born with their, with their iPhones in their hand and, you know, this, this world of individuality, yeah, uh, the, the, you know, the, the way to get, get together, uh, unionize is kind of, you know, it's, it's not that hip. It's not that cool to do that it, like in sweden it's like you know i'm 25 i don't need the union but hey when something happens you you really need them and so um, hopefully this in sweden no matter if you're a right wing or a left wing people people are behind the union here against elon musk to the most part. And I hope that it stays that way and that we can, I, I think the solution is that we have to, you know, the small people has to get together like they did in America, like you said, so good for them. So as somebody who, who wrote extensively about Alric and uh, covered his life, researched his life, <laughs> who would you say reminds you of Alric? Who do you think a modern day Alric would be? Yeah, you know, who would it be in these days? I think he would like be. A, he was. You know, his his uh, granddaughter said he was like a a guy who saw things in black or white, right or wrong. You know, and he he paid a hard price for that because he had high moral standards. I guess. So I guess he, he, people would look at him like a problem guy. I guess you know, useful for his people but for for, for uh you know the corporates he, he he would definitely be a problem because he he was willing to to pay the high price you know and he did yeah. Yeah. so you mentioned shows in oslo and i think you said gothenburg yeah now in may we're playing oslo gothenburg and stockholm and the weekend after that we're going to play at the desert fest in uh, london so that's going to be great it's our first gig outside scandinavia so uh, really looking forward to that and then we have some some dates in in europe and germany and poland and uh, maybe serbia actually in 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 the fall so uh we're we're looking forward to that. So um, we want to tell the world the story of Ulrich, you know? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And I think it's a, it's a very important story to tell. I think so, too. The story of Ulrich is called Head Hammer Man, and it's out now through Prosthetic Records. Henrik, yeah. please tell everyone how they can order the album and get the book. Yeah. That's the best way to get both of them. Yeah, if you want the English version, I guess we're talking English, you will find the book at Amazon. Just search for Head Hammer Man and you will find it. And the record, yeah, it's available on all kind of digital sites. Amazon, but of course, uh, Prosthetic Records and uh, our band camp. Just search for Horndall and you will find it. Yeah, and if you want like merchandise, 
you you will go to a Swedish website called T N O R dot S E. T N O R dot S E. There you find all our T shirts and stuff like that. Uh, and follow us on Instagram and Facebook. <laughs> no, no, this is this is the un- uncomfortable part of this. Yeah. <laughs> we're, we're we're on every kind of platform there. Yeah, very cool. I mean, by the time people hear this episode, I think all the vinyl versions might be sold out. But did Prosthetic do any special editions for this? You know, it, it is made in different colors. The vinyl is in different colors. We have this uh, orange version that we call Molted Steel. It looked like like orange molted steel. And then we have the Union Red, of course. And then there is a gray one. And I actually don't know what kind of colors they have in America right now. But yeah, they keep doing new ones. Very annoying for the collectors to, to, <laughs> if they want to have it all. Yeah. And I guess that's the purpose. Not our fault, though, I have to tell you. Yeah. So they keep on going. Yeah. And that's, there's a CD, of course. We wanted to do the cassette. But we didn't have the possibility. Hopefully, last record was made on cassette. It was really cool, I think. So let's see. Now, is Head Hammer Man your first full novel? Is this your first book? Yeah, it is. It is. You know, I've been ghostwriting stuff in my work. I don't want to talk about it, you know, but I'm writing a lot. This is my first novel, and yeah, how do you how do you move on from this? I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> uh, but it has been uh, you know. It, it sounds like you have a lot of a lot of inspiration just in in your own town. I mean, I'm curious if there's other, um, you know, it, it, it's it's a far reaching thing. Yeah. These, these uh, yeah, uh, these industrial towns that uh, kind of rise and fall with. Uh, um, with the changing of, mm. of industries. Yeah. I'm, I'm curious if you have ideas on, on what the next album or what the next book might be. Yeah, uh, you know, we're discussing it in the moment, but there's a, there's some things going on. Uh, not sure what it's going to be. You know, I have these old guys in Horndal that are kind of sending me all this material. I got this story that were actually a wolf in, in Horndal that, that was, that, that killed a lot of kids when they were going with food to their fathers to the steel mill in like in the 1880, like a long time ago. That sounded really like, uh, you know, the Red Hood and the Wolf fairy tale. But I uh, know that's maybe one song, not an album. So, uh, you know, we're, we're not sure where we're going to end up on next record. I asked Pontus for some Judas Priest riffs. <laughs> I want to play on the A string. Nice. You know, it's, it's a long time, long time ago since I had to play on the A string. I like that. <laughs> very cool. So you've been very generous <laughs> with your time. Yeah. But is there anything else you want to say? Uh, you know, uh, come to us and uh, if you have a club, book us. We will come anywhere, you know. We would love to come to play anywhere in the world. We want to meet you guys. Very cool. Talk to Mjuket, Henrik. Tack så mycket. <laughs> kan du svenska? <laughs> a little bit, a little bit. Do you know Swedish? A little bit, a little bit. Okay. A lot of, lot of. Uh, but you live in Malaysia. I live in Malaysia, yeah. But uh, I'm a Malaysian who has yeah. uh, a lot of Swedish death and black metal records, so I had to learn some Swedish along the way. Ah, uh, of course, <laughs> yeah. There's sometimes we sometimes sing in Swedish, yeah, as, yeah, a, yeah. as you probably yeah. noticed. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah.